Welcome to the Reinventing Transport Show, the international podcast that helps you push for better urban mobility and better cities. Welcome again. I'm Paul Barter. If you're new to the podcast, I'm a Singapore-based freelance trainer, teacher, researcher, writer and podcaster on urban transport and parking policy. Before we get started, I want to give a very quick thank you to my supporters on Patreon. There are 10 of you so far, and I want to thank you all very much for your vote of confidence. If you're not a patron yet, you can support my reinventing transport and reinventing parking efforts and find out more about what extras you will get in return by visiting patreon.com slash paulbarter. That's patreon.com slash paulbarter. Now, here comes episode 13 of Reinventing Transport. What if I told you your city could have better public transport without extra funding and without high affairs? I wouldn't blame you if you said that sounds too good to be true. But this episode is about just such an opportunity that many cities are missing. Let's start the story with an important question. Are bus waiting times too long in your city? It makes bus travel unattractive, right? But most people think that fixing this problem would mean a huge subsidy. You'd need to pump a lot of money in and have more buses and uh, get shorter waiting times. Not necessarily. Maybe you have too many bus routes, too many bus lines. Maybe you can do better by simplifying the bus network. That may sound odd if you haven't come across this idea before. So let me explain. Imagine a town with 100 buses. And suppose that town has 25 bus lines, so it would have four buses for each line. But what if the town simplifies its bus network down to just five lines? Then there would be 20 buses on every line. Of course, that means much shorter waiting times. Now, I imagine some of you are hopping up and down and saying, wait a minute, 25 bus lines can connect more places with one seat bus trips than five lines can. What's the point of having short waiting times on that five-line network if everyone has to make transfers, everyone has to make connections? People hate connections, right? Well, yes and no. These two networks represent two very different responses to the idea of transfers or connections. On the one hand, many cities try to minimize connections, but then they end up with many bus lines. Each of them has low frequency. Or the city can simplify the bus network and achieve higher bus frequencies, but then you'll have more transfers. They have to work hard then to make sure that the pain of those transfers is not too much. Part of that is shorter waiting time, but there are other ways to minimize the pain. So that's the crux of the issue. And the good news is that it turns out that we can very often come out ahead when we simplify the network. Let's take a look at Barcelona. TMB, the Transit Authority in Barcelona, described the old bus network, before the changes I'm going to talk about, like this. The Barcelona bus network was the heir to the tram network of the previous century. As the city grew, the routes were extended and superimposed until a network was created that was illogical, with repetition of lines and journeys that were slow and buses that were infrequent. Neither were connections ensured between different parts of the city, and for the uninitiated user, the network was hard to understand and read on a map. Does that sound anything like bus networks where you are? Barcelona also has a significant metro and suburban rail system, but it was not getting the best from its bus system. Actually, the bus frequencies in Barcelona averaged around 12 minutes, even in the old network, which is actually not too bad. But you need to be aware that Barcelona is a high-density city, with a lot of the trips actually very short. 7.2 kilometres is the average transit trip length, and bus trips are probably even shorter than that. So 12 minutes waiting, or more, is actually a long wait if your bus ride is 5 kilometres or less. So, Barcelona came up with a plan for a Nova Xarxa, a new network. It emerged from modelling from an academic in, in Berkeley, California, by the name of Carlos Daganzo. Now that the new network is actually fully operational, the new network has 28 high-performance lines. There are 17 that are called vertical lines, 
running from the sea up to the mountains. Eight are so-called horizontal lines, and three are diagonal. According to a 2017 paper by Carlos de Ganzo and several colleagues, I'll quote here, the Nova Shosha will eventually be served by 573 buses with an average headway of 6.18 minutes, similar across all lines. Contrast this with the old bus network, which was served by 761 buses with an average headway of 12.3 minutes. Thus, the Nova Shosha will use fewer buses but deliver nearly twice the service frequency of the old network. On the old network, 13% of bus trips involved transfers. But according to this same paper, in 2016, 26% of boardings on the current Nova Shosha network at that time came from transferring passengers, and the authors expected that to rise to 44% once the entire network was deployed. I'd be curious to know if that's actually happened. So according to Eric Goldwyn and Alon Levy, who were writing in City Lab uh, last year, the ridership results are looking good so far. So the, the bus ridership in Barcelona has risen from 180 million in 2012 when this process started to 202 million in 2017. And the trends since then seem to be quite good as well. Now, this is not because of cannibalizing from Metro. The, the Metro and the other rail uh, ridership has been stable. So this is, this is probably all about the Nova Scotia. So that was Barcelona, a key example. Lots of cities around the world are doing something like this. Actually, Australia's capital city, Canberra, will be shifting to a new network this week. Portland, Oregon in the United States, was a pioneer. Portland adopted a simple grid of frequent bus lines in 1982. By the way, I'll put links to all of these various sources in the show notes. In Europe, it seems that Hamburg and then later other cities like Munich and uh, Swiss cities have been doing this kind of thing. Not not all European cities, but some. It, it seems to be the norm in, in um, Central Europe, at least. Vienna, for example, clearly has a grid-like network of trams, buses, and metro lines. It's very clear if you look at the map of the network just to the west of the old central area. I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a map of that in the show notes as well. San Francisco... The part, of, the part of the network that's inside San Francisco itself by Muni is clearly a grid. One of the leading experts on this issue of bus network redesigns is Jarrett Walker uh, and his colleagues at his consulting firm. So he's been helping various cities, uh, especially in North America, but also elsewhere, famously Houston, Richmond, and that there are several others. New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, has now fully shifted to its new network, Dublin is a case right now of a city that's going through a bus network redesign. It's, I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. Some other examples from around the world. Uh, Santiago de Chile is an, an example. It's uh, the great saga of the Transantiago reforms, which, in which um, they tried to do many things all at once. Uh, was actually disastrous initially, but I would very much like to see some follow-up research. Bogota in Colombia and Medellin in Colombia have also been reforming their bus networks at the same time as changing the regulatory approach. A success story in Asia is Seoul. It's a famous example. In, in 2004, Seoul did a major shake-up of its whole bus industry. It was a big bang like Santiago, and it was also uh, considered disastrous for a little while, but uh, soon afterwards, was seen as a success, and a key feature of this was a much more connective bus network. I was in Yangon in Myanmar recently, and I was surprised to learn that uh, Yangon has also been reforming its bus network, simplifying the routes, reducing the number of routes, and trying to have a better level of service on each of those routes. I understand Bangalore in India has been piloting some network changes on some of its corridors with the help of the WRI, Ross Centre for Sustainable Cities. I hear also that Jakarta is trying to do a better job of having coordination between the uh, informal minibuses and some of the trunk buses served by BRT, the Trans-Jakarta service. In all of these cases, I don't, I don't actually know the full story and I'm really curious to know how it's going. Does a bus network that 
sorely needs simplifying look like? So how, how will you tell if you look at your own bus network, how will you know, does it need this kind of attention? Well, one kind of problematic bus network focuses too much on the city centre. In the developing world, for example, or also perhaps in the UK, cities where most public transport is deregulated, maybe by informal sector minivans like uh, Matatu or minibus taxis in South Africa or jeepneys in Philippines, for example, whatever they are called in, in the relevant city. So it's very common for cities like that to end up with a public transport network that looks like a bamboo grove, large numbers of parallel stems along major roads out of the city centre, but they then spread out towards the end edge of the, of the city. Seoul's old bus lines looked like a set, a set of bamboo groves uh, before the 2004 reforms. A lot of the UK's deregulated bus systems apparently have this kind of tendency as well. A similar thing seems to have happened in a lot of other Western cities that are relatively car dependent. They have city owned and formal sector well regulated buses, but a lot of these cities have ended up with bus networks that serve mainly the old city centre. Like uh, Barcelona, their bus network is based on a historic old established lines from 50 or 100 years ago. They haven't updated that network for a modern, bigger, city with multiple destinations and they've given up on even trying so the the old core of the city is the, the main market for public transport trips and most of the public transport network serves just radial service into and out of that core area another kind of bus network that needs simplifying is in cities with more successful public transport so big, big cities that are actually rather multimodal, uh, like Barcelona, actually. Um, I'm in Singapore, and Singapore is an example. The problem in these cities is not that the bus network is too focused on the city centre, although Bar Barcelona did have a little bit of that problem with its old network. But the problem is that these networks try too hard to be ubiquitous. They try to try to provide too many lines to too many places from too many places. So each of those lines ends up being infrequent. So in these cities, the bus network ends up looking like a tangle of wires. Unfortunately, it seems to be too easy to end up overdoing this and ending up with a, a network with just too many lines and not enough demand on each of the lines to justify high frequency service. So in Singapore, for example, a lot of bus lines have waiting times, headways, throughout the day that is somewhere between 12 and 15, sometimes up to 20 minutes. Not good enough in a really transit-oriented, high-density city like Singapore. So you might think that maybe, say, in Singapore, improving bus frequencies would be just a matter of giving the bus system more resources. Singapore doesn't subsidise its buses, or hardly at all. It could do more. But if it did that, if it if it uh, boosted frequencies on, on the tangled muddle of wire network that it has, th there would be another problem. There's already some bus congestion in Singapore and it would get worse if bus frequencies increase with this existing tangled network, which has a lot of overlaps. So it's actually slightly paradoxical that you can risk bus congestion by having a bus network that has too many lines with each of those lines having low frequency service or relatively low frequency service. So let's take stock. Your city probably needs a more connective network, a simpler bus network, if many of your bus lines have fewer than one bus every 15 minutes. In fact, in dense cities, having a bus less than every 10 minutes or so on many lines is probably not good enough. You probably need a more connective network if your bus network is so complicated that you can't put it on a map easily or if the map looks like a tangle of wire. Your city probably needs a more connective bus network if the bus network looks like a series of bamboo groves sprouting from the city centre, but with almost no routes in any other direction. So if you did simplify your bus network, you would be able to achieve higher bus frequencies with the same resources, with the same number of buses, or possibly even with fewer buses. Now, higher frequencies means shorter headways, shorter waiting times. 
That means shorter waits for that first bus. It also means shorter waits for any connecting buses that you might need along your journey. So if all goes well, most existing journeys will end up taking less time in total, even though they now require a connection, many of them. And so faster journeys with shorter waiting times also means that more people should be able to reach more places in a reasonable amount of time. You've increased people's freedom, as Jared Walker is fond of saying. So this is exactly what Barcelona has been trying to do with its Nova Scotia. So cities that do this work very hard to ease the pain of connections. Now, we've already talked about reducing the waiting times. Another step is to make sure there's no financial cost of making a transfer. There should be no new uh, ticket involved, for example. And then physically, bus stops on perpendicular lines might need to be brought closer to intersections. Singapore has a problem. If, if Singapore wants to have a connective network, it would need to bring its bus stops much closer to intersections. And there are various other ways to physically make the physical uh, experience of making a connection less less difficult. Avo avoid making people go up and down stairs, for example. Make sure it's very clear. One thing Barcelona has worked very hard on with the Nova Xarxa is very clear guidance, with clear wayfinding, so people can work out where they have to go to make their transfers. So I, I mentioned Jarrett Walker. Let me mention a few other people who have been leaders in this process of pushing for public transport networks that are more connective, pushing for public transport networks that are simpler, more transfer-based. There's been a lot of practical people in many cities, people in Zurich, uh, in Portland, which was a North American pioneer. Jarrett Walker mentions two particular people, Ken Zatarain and Thomas G. Matoff are especially crucial for the 1982 bus network changes in that city. Paul Mees, who sadly passed away a few years back from Melbourne in Australia, was a key thinker on this. It turns out he was actually inspired, he, he acknowledges that he was inspired by the PhD thesis of my friend uh, Felix Lauber, who is from Zurich, and uh, who did a PhD at the same time as me in, in Australia. He wrote very clearly in his thesis about the connective networks that are used in Zurich in, in Switzerland. Gustav Nielsen from Norway has been a proponent of this kind of network reforms. And I also already mentioned Carlos Daganzo from UC Berkeley. So, of course, I'm, I'm probably forgetting many people and there's been a lot of other people behind the scenes. appeal of these network reforms is you can get big rewards for a rather small investment in but it's not easy politically this is a challenging reform to enact if you think about it it's 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 very normal for people to react badly when something is taken away from them and this kind of network reform involves simplifying the network so a pretty significant proportion of people who are currently using your bus network will lose the bus lines that they are used to. Some of those people will have to make a transfer in their daily routine that they didn't previous have previously have to make. And, and it's rather daunting to explain. They may not take kindly to you saying, well, most people are going to win. On average, people are going to arrive at their destinations sooner. On average, people will be able to reach more places in a shorter amount of time people don't care about on average they care about their <laughs> what they are losing and especially if certain neighborhoods or certain groups of people lose in these network changes and they get organized it's it's uh, very common for there to be very noisy uh, opposition it doesn't help if there's confusion uh, let, let me mention dublin's bus connect Jarrett Walker explains that it's always pretty feisty but uh, in in dublin it was especially so Here's my understanding. I hope someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think what happened was that the main bus drivers union in Dublin was already very mistrustful of the authorities, the transport authorities in that city, for various other reasons, and perhaps justifiably so. This meant that they were very, very sceptical of this bus, bus network reform, and in fact came out very vociferously against it and raised many objections, many of them r rather... Uh, let's let's call it misinformation. That's the diplomatic term. <laughs> so 
And also there was a lot of suspicion that the pro initial proposal was set in stone and that it would not be modified even if people gave input. So even though Bus Connects and Jarrett Walker's firm were very much inviting input and saying, we will change this in various ways. Here are the principles we want to stick to, but there are many details that we can change if we find that um, we've made mistakes. And it's a complex place. Big cities are always complicated. But uh, some of the op opponents not only said, this is bad, they also said the consultation is a sham and they've already decided and there's no point consulting, which is a, a rather unfortunate thing. Now, this is not unusual. Life is like this. If you're in public life, you get used to having acrimonious debates. But the point here is that this is not for the faint-hearted. And even though this is a, a very promising kind of a reform, you shouldn't embark on it if you're not really determined. So and another reason this is politically difficult is that this is a, a great example of something revealed preference is more reliable than stated preference. So what, what I mean by that is that how people actually respond in practice to a change, such as a connective network, is sometimes different from how they expect to react and what they say they will do. And that's challenging. So that's in some ways that's challenging for our democratic principles. We want to uh, listen to people and take account of their preferences. But Jarrett Walker explains in various places that it's, it, it's important to design a process in which people are able to see the trade-offs and face up to the consequences of their preferences. It's sometimes not possible to have incompatible things. We can't just take it at face value when people say they want high frequencies and a one-seat service on all of their buses. Another problem is that people's experience today with making a, a connection between one bus line and another bus line is usually abysmal. If both of those bus lines have low frequencies, then the waiting time is liable to be unpredictable and long. It's hard for people to imagine making convenient bus-to-bus -bus connections under a system where we've got high-frequency buses. They just don't trust that that will happen. So it doesn't mean that cities should just ram these changes through. People need a process in which they can see the trade-offs and see uh, the consequences of choices. It's not easy. It's not for the faint-hearted, but the rewards are great. So if you're interested in this issue, I really recommend visiting Jarrett Walker's website, Human Transit, and looking at this various stories from various cities that he's worked in. So given that this is difficult, maybe the surprise is not so much that that there's not that many cities doing this. The surprise is that this actually is gathering some steam, this this kind of network reform. So we see more and more cities. I already mentioned a few earlier, Portland, Houston, uh, Columbus, Austin, Richmond. In a context in North America where bus ridership has been declining, the cities that have redesigned their bus networks seem to be holding up much better than the others. I mentioned Auckland in New Zealand, and I interviewed some people from the Greater Auckland blog recently. So if you want to see how that's going in Auckland, go take a look at the Greater Auckland blog and search for New Network. Over the next year or two, I plan to interview various people on this issue and find out how, how this story is going. So, so look out for those future episodes. So let me end with the bottom line again. If your bus network has lots of lines that overlap each other, if it has low bus frequencies throughout most of the day, then your city could probably benefit from this kind of bus network redesign. The key things that a transfer-based network, a connective network, needs for success, a simple and easy to understand network with easy transfers and high frequency services. Especially make sure that service levels and frequencies really do increase. Don't simplify your network and end up with weaker service than you had before. Make sure connections really are easy. It's not easy to do this, but the rewards seem to be great and they seem to be lasting. Cities with successful public transport around the world tend to have rather connective public transport. So I, I really wish more cities would at least take a look at this. There are variations on this that suit small towns and big cities. There seem to be variations that suit dense transit-oriented cities and car-oriented low-density cities. 
Is this something that you could be championing in your own city or town? I hope I've persuaded you that it's worth a look. So thank you for listening. That's all for now. Don't forget, you can always go to reinventingtransport.org for more information, to listen to other episodes, to find out how to subscribe, or to leave a comment, suggestion, or question. Go to reinventingtransport.org. This has been the Reinventing Transport Show, and I'm Paul Barter. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye for now.